Well, alrighty, I had originally planned to do this Q&A a day or two ago, but some recent events had uh, obviously shifted the priorities a little bit, so had to adjust. So this is coming out, I think it's going to be Monday night right before Raw. I'm recording it Sunday night, but it's going to come out Monday night uh, before Raw. So thank you guys for uh, sending your questions to at OTR Central on Twitter. If you don't follow the show on Twitter, you should think about doing so. That way you can participate in these Q&As in the future and follow me as I'm watching some of these shows. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you smash that subscribe button. i uh, got lots of questions to get through. We'll see how many I can get through in the next 15 minutes or so. Let's go ahead and start off with Soupy, who kicks us off by saying, Do you recall when you started to hear or see the start of the now, ultimately proven false thanks to the work of NWO Wolfpack TV, rumors allegations against Kevin Nash being the lowest drawing WWE, WWF champion of all time? I think I really started to see that, if I'm not mistaken, like in the late 90s. I, it was a way to kind of diminish what the NWO were doing down in WCW. It was a way for uh, WWF and their people to, to try and do some damage control and put some spin that made them look good. And yes, I would agree. It's not true. And as NWO Wolfpack TV has done, you know, I appreciate the fact that he... They incorporate numbers to, to make their point. They're not just going off of opinion or hypotheticals or anything like that. Uh, Alex, does it surprise you that some hardcore fans still praise Cena to this day for basically having better matches in the past five years or so? Like how God now is their savior even though he used to bury young talent. Uh, <laughs> praise God. Oh, God. Everything that is the Hunter, the Hearst, and the Helmsley. Now, as far as the first part of that... I think you also got to remember, too, that the hardcore fans are a little bit younger now, too, skewing more maybe in the 20s. So a lot of these cats grew up with Cena being their hero back in the day. And, you know, so they got Cena pounded down their throat for a decade plus. Like, they think what happened with Cena is normal and or okay, or they're using looking at it from their, their kid world view and think that this is good, and it wasn't. And as far as the having better matches in the past five years or so, like... Dude only wrestles like once or twice a year now. Like, damage is already done. Fuck Cena. It's one of those things of absence makes the heart grow fonder. It doesn't for me. Now when he does come back, it's like he clearly doesn't give a crap. Oh, it's cute. Now you want to put everybody over because it doesn't matter because you don't care. When you did care, you often did the wrong thing for business and helped kill the business. And we should not be making a hero out of John Cena. Add MJ, make a podcast. Why does Vince McMahon always seem to go back to the legends well when ratings hit a new all-time low? Once again, it seems to be putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. I think it's almost like putting Neosporin on a meteor crater at this point. Um, it's because it's a panic. It's a reactionary move. Because he knows he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing anymore. And that's the reality. Like He knows he doesn't know what he's doing anymore. He really doesn't. So, it's all he's got. Because it's the easy, low-hanging fruit. And every time he does it, it's just a diminishing return that he receives and also creates a negative impact of future, even more diminishing returns. MC17 Clark, thoughts on the Von Erich tragedies? And which one do you think was the saddest one of all? In my opinion, it's Chris Von Erich. Um, I disagree. I think it's David. David, I believe, was the oldest one. David's the one that died over in Japan, like, in late 20s. You know, he was in the peak of his career. That, to me, is the most tragic. The other ones, like all the suicides of Carrie and Mike and Chris, like, those are tragic and all, but only tragic to a certain level. Like, at the end of the day, they made the decision to take their own lives, you know, which... It's hard to pass judgment on those that make that decision. And on the one hand, you know, it, it, you have to ultimately have the courage to make the move to end your own life. But it's an incredibly fucking cowardly thing to do. It absolutely is. Like, you're doing something that is incredibly selfish. And you're leaving behind loved ones, family members, friends in your wake. Because you were too selfish. And you did what you thought was best for you and the hell with everybody else. And, and I know when I've said that over the years that people get really pissy about it, but tough shit. Like, that's the way it is. 
It is. Like, everybody has the control, you know, of whether they make that decision to ultimately end their own life or not. And it's their decision to make. But it's an incredibly selfish and cowardly thing to do. It absolutely is. So I don't think those suicides are the most tragic. I think David's was. Because I don't think he's the one that did it to himself compared to the others. The other ones suck. But I think that one was the worst. Uh, Sue Pete, back with another question. Thoughts on Gary Hart? Um, Gary Hart was good back in the day. And great. On the shoot interviews, like he's a guy, I think part of your question was, uh, would you have liked to have seen him in WWF? Maybe man, somebody like a great Muda or a one-man gang, certainly maybe a one-man gang. Um, kind of sucks that he never really got a, a run, a big run in WWF, because I thought he could have done well there. Uh, at Volfan says, obviously Cena versus Orton at WrestleMania is the dream match. Obviously Volfan0531, that is the dream match. What would you want them to do with Edge if Orton is tied up? Bring Batista's ass back out of retirement and have you a fortunate four-themed pay-per-view. It's Orton versus Cena. It's Edge versus Batista. That's what you do. That's what you do. I don't care what you do with Edge at this point. It's Orton and Cena at WrestleMania. <laughs> um, Joseph Moran. Isn't it striking when you go back with Brody Lee and WWE that they kept him back from being more than what he could have been? Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. Not everybody's destined to be a main eventer. Not everybody's destined to be the top guy. Not everybody's destined to be a world champion. I, re, re, realistically, I would have never put a world title on him. But also, I think, like I said before, and then when I'm talking about his passing, you know, look at Jonathan Huber, like, he had a hell of a career, man. He was on national primetime television for years between Raw and SmackDown and then later on AEW. He won multiple tag team championships, was an intercontinental champion, was a TNT title holder. Like, his career was not all crap. Like, when you look at Jonathan Huber's wrestling career, Compared to a lot of other folks, his was pretty damn good. Made a good amount of money, had a pretty nice length of run. Like, you know, and sometimes it's easy to focus on the things that you feel should have been true, even if they really weren't supposed to be true, instead of focusing on the positives of all the things that that man did and what he was able to do in his career. Think about how many people in the world of professional wrestling never get close to what Jonathan Huber achieved. Think about that. And how many of them would trade everything to be able to get in the spot that he was in for years? Like, yeah, there were times I felt they could have done more with him and done better with him. I would agree. But it doesn't diminish what he did accomplish. And that should be what we focus on. Kieran Chase. Do you think it annoys Vince that Sasha, Becky, and Bailey, to an extent, got more over than Charlotte? Uh, yeah. Because, again, it's an example of if... Vince doesn't want to put the machine behind you. He does not want to get behind you. He does not want the people to get behind you, no matter what you do. Although I would sit there and say, uh, the WWE got pretty behind Becky Lynch. They got really behind her. Uh, so I don't know if it annoys them that she got over to the degree that she did. I think it annoys them that Sasha Banks has a level of star power that on, they only pretend and dream that Charlotte has when it comes to ratings and attention and so forth. I think they hold it against her that she went out there, got her own thing from the, you know, talking about the Mandalorian series. And that's why they barely mention it. They don't mention it. They don't talk about it. Because they don't like the fact that it didn't go through them. It wasn't them. It wasn't their idea. It wasn't their thing. Um, so, yeah, I think it annoys Vince because he's petty like that. Uh... Dalek of Chaos, do you think Luna Vachon could have been a good fit for the Ministry of Darkness? And do you think Luna could have won the Women's Championship in this scenario? Let me be clear. Luna Vachon, as a manager, is a great fit for anything. Pisses me off that she was never part of a featured Hall of Fame class. I think, didn't they put her, like, do the legacy crap with her and kind of sweep her under the rug? That's bullshit. 
Luna Vachon deserved better. She deserved a hell of a lot better. Because in her run in WWF, everything she was associated with got better because she was associated with it. So I don't care if it's Ministry of Darkness, Brood, you know, whatever. You don't gotta put her in a fucking nation of domination for all the hell I care. And she would have somehow figured out a way to make it work. And you, they might think that's crazy. But you dismiss and belittle the talent that was Luna Vachon. She was incredible. At center 51, 190, how powerful would the story between Roman and Brian be if they touched on the fact that Roman was rejected by the crowd after he was gifted Brian's spot and that the man was kept in retirement in part to keep him out of Roman's way? Now, this is an example of when James Feluca says this, that he's being delusional and disconnected from reality. But if we humor him for a second and we take a more accurate spin, and not, not this foolishness that he's talking about, but if we just talk about the fact of the storytelling dynamics that are there for a Daniel Bryan at this time and a Roman Reigns at this time, like, yes, they should absolutely be touching on that stuff from the Rumble years ago. They should be talking about, you know, how it was supposed to be Daniel Bryan's spot, but Roman Reigns took that spot, and he ain't getting that shit up, and Daniel Bryan's not good enough to get it back. Like, there's a lot of things you could do with it. From a pure storytelling aspect, it's probably the most intriguing non-rock-based thing that they could do for WrestleMania for Roman. Um, at Johnny Bronx 23, Bronx 23, in the reality of today's wrestling, especially WWE, isn't the concept of heel and babyface a thing of the past? No. No. Especially if you do it right. Roman Reigns, look at him. Top babyface. Top babyface. Top babyface. Uh, the concept of heel and babyface being a thing of the past is really stupid. It really is. And all that is, is a defense mechanism put out there by people in wrestling that don't know what the hell they're doing and don't know how to book heels and babyfaces correctly. That's what it is. It ain't any of this, it ain't any of that. Like the approach of how you get to a great babyface or a great heel might change. And it might be more challenging in some ways. I don't disagree with that. But to say that it's totally changed and that dynamic doesn't work is completely idiotic because the business is still ultimately built on heat. And the best way to have heat is between a heel and a baby face. So, yeah. Jack, who does Dave Meltzer whack off to more? Okada or Kenny Omega? Yes. <laughs> Next question. American Dream Runny Nose, Mojo, Jojo, 1104. Did you like Eric Bischoff as an on-screen character more in WCW or WWE? Honestly, as an on-screen character, WWE. If I was more mature, more polished as an on-screen character, much easier to dislike him on TV, on Raw, over the years. Uh, Byron Andreas, would you ever do a reaction video of the Jay Lethal Ric Flair promo? <laughs> never say never. <laughs> Um, let's see here. Tribal Believer. How long do you think AEW should keep this MJF and Chris Jericho inner circle storyline going? Uh, probably start to pay it off by the next pay-per-view. I think it's in February. They probably pay it off before. They might pay it off as soon as the January 6th show. Um, you know, doesn't mean you have to draw to a conclusion immediately, but you probably want to get to start getting to the point sooner rather than later. Um... Mukahid Killink, who is the right superstar to take the universal belt from the tribal chief, and how should it be done? No, no, no. There's no reason to even think about it right now. There's no reason to entertain that thought, so let's not go there. Jake the Surgeon, will we finally get our Breakfast Club main event this year with God as special guest referee? Oh, praise God. Give me Orton versus Cena with Triple H as a guest referee. I don't ask for much in this world, and like I said, I always get less than what I ask for. But could I get this one favor just this one time? <laughs> uh, a poor Shankar, do you think there's any truth to the Stephanie and Randy Savage rumors or is it one of those crazy wrestling stories? I think it's one of those crazy wrestling stories that is probably not true but has enough believability factor there that you still think that it could be. And a lot of that has to do with how Vince just basically blacklisted the Macho Man for a decade and a half. Yeah, like, with some of the people that did 
Vince way dirtier that he did business with a lot quicker. He never brought Macho Man back into the fold. That's why people believe there's way more to the story, and frankly, to this day, I still kind of do too. Uh, Mid Carter J, what is Sid's most underrated moment? Uh, beating Sean in the Garden for the title at Survivor Series '96. Sid turned the MSG crowd against Shawn Michaels. That's a pretty damn impressive thing to do. The Heartbreak Kid, the showstopper, the icon, the main event, and Sid went in there and. Bounded that shit in. The fans were universally behind Sid and said, Screw you, Sean. That's an underrated Sid moment. Son Goshuaku. What's something in pro wrestling that upon first viewing as a smarter fan you thought was absolute trash, but now you absolutely love it when revisiting? Something in pro wrestling that upon first viewing as a smarter fan you thought was absolute trash, but now you absolutely love it when revisiting. Ooh. You come with some of these interesting, like, thought-provoking questions, and I don't know if I have a great answer for that. Um, yeah, I don't know that I have a great answer for that. Uh -huh. If the question was reversed, like, Something you used to think was great, but you now realize it's shit. Like, I, I could go in a whole bunch of detail there. But to your question, I'm not really sure. Uh, at Lord underscore JCW, do you think it would be a wise decision for the WWE to bring back Saturday night's main event as maybe a substitute for some of the secondary pay-per-views? I don't think it would hurt to have one or two of them a year. And maybe you do a thing like you'd have one on NBC. And maybe, maybe it'd be like... It's a challenge though when you're going up against Saturday Night Live, you know, being in that slot. But you, know, you probably figure it out like maybe you do one a year on NBC, one a year on Fox. Worst things can happen. Uh, Stephen Penafield. In your opinion, what is John Cena's greatest wrestling moment? His debut match against Kurt Angle's WrestleMania 21 victory. His return at the 2008 Rumble's WrestleMania 28 match against The Rock. So win at the Rumble in 2017 to become a 16-time champion. Like from a pure ego and history standpoint, it's that Breakfast Club moment of becoming 16-time champion. Uh, my still to me, my fate one of my favorite moments of his of all time was his debut against Kurt Angle back at SmackDown in 2002. Uh, Edsel Jerome Laurel should WWE keep the Universal Title on Reigns until emerging new emerging star is over enough? Yes. I don't even think about it right now. Try and build up some guys, and you think about the future, but I'll stop being in a hurry to take the belt off the Tribal Chief. This reign that he reign that he has, Reigns needs a long Reigns as champion. Uh, live forever. If Big E wins one of the world titles at Mania, is him versus Kofi a pay-per-view main event down the line? No. No. I don't think it is. Personally, I don't think it is. Trent Gaspard, if Draw didn't get paralyzed, do you think he would have been a major player in the mid card of the Attitude Era at some point? Potentially, yes. Potentially. Um, Keys 10 asked a similar question what I already talked about. Instead of monthly pay per views, should the WWE bring back Saturday Night Main Event for maybe one or two secondary pay per views a year, replace it with the main event show? I would agree with that. Um, Johnny Rasslin. If John Cena wasn't around in 2005, who would you have put in his position as the WWE champ on Raw? Yeah, well. But at the time, though, wasn't Cena on SmackDown before he got brought over to Raw? Um... Maybe Edge. Team Forward, what YWC YouTubers do you watch? Reality? Not much. And that's not a disrespect to anybody. That's not thinking that I'm better than everybody else. I'm clearly not. Look at the view numbers, look at the subscriber totals. It's just a matter of, you know, I work a lot of hours in my real world job. And doing this stuff between this channel, the, the Slight Daddy TV channel where I talk about sports and shit, it takes up a ton of time. I got other things, other coals in the fire. 
So I just don't have a ton of time to watch a bunch of YouTubers talk about wrestling. You know, every once in a while, I might peek at some of these bigger channels to see, like, hey, what are things that they do that I do not that I could incorporate? Um, but not anybody that I really watch with any uh, religiousness or anything like that. So, um, yeah. I didn't make anybody mad, but that's the truth. Uh, Wrestling Ranch is a caveat for Dino Bravo going into the WWE Hall of Fame. Be that he has to show for his induction. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Pro Wrestling Talk. When do you think Sid will go into the Hall of Fame and who should induct him? <laughs> he should go in the Hall of Fame every year. And who should induct him? It should be me! Who would do Sid more justice? Who would possibly show more energy or interest in Sid going into the WWE Hall of Fame? Like, all joking and all bullshit aside, who could do better than me? Maybe Johnny Ace! <laughs> and that's it! I'm done. Smash the subscribe button if you enjoyed this Q&A. Be back again with more videos this week. Q&A next week, I'm sure. See you later. <laughs> you gotta jump off the second rope, kid. Expand your offensive repertoire. <laughs>